Yeah, some are, yeah, some are a lot more competent than others for, uh, you mean, uptake of DNA and transformation, yeah. Tobacco and its relatives are widely used. Uh, I, I came in late. Well. Well. Question about, uh, at the talk that we all ha heard the other day on Friday, talking about putting multi-gene DNAs into plants, what exactly is the problem with putting multi-gene DNAs into plants? Is there a size thing? No. What's the issue? I, I, I'm afraid I have to s disagree with Daphne. She said you can't put any more than three genes. I so think do I. We, we have at least eight now. Um, so I, I don't think that's a problem. Um, what you have to do is be smart. Not only do you need a transcriptional terminator, but you need a transcriptional block. Um, and so, and that's eight per tDNA, so you could easily put in two tDNAs, that's relatively easy. So that's easily to put in 16. So I, I'm afraid I have to disagree. Yeah, with there, there are examples of nine genes. And that, that's more. using agrobacterium? Or the, the, the issue uh, is, is the size of agro. You usually go through, um, usually go through E. coli. Um, and then go coli to agrobacterium. And as you know, once you get over 20 kb, you can get over 20 kb, but it just gets a lot yeah, harder. Gets, okay. um, so it's the standard that. problems that you have in E. coli that are limiting with plants. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. It's not you, a special problem. But, but you can do it. You yeah, can do it. You just, just gotta, harder. You've got to want to do it. Um, <laughs> and, um, you have good motivation. Yeah, yeah. So if you're motivated, you can do it. There's no, no big problem. To add to that, I many years ago I did a rotation project for my PhD in, in that um, we put in 12 different genes and just a novice with uh, biolistics and they all went in. Um, I, I don't know why yeah. that, that was a surprise to me telling the I, I think Daphne was trying to, well, she's a great person. <laughs> <laughs> so I have another question. Um, Everyone agree, she's a great person. Right. One of the things that Daphne was highlighting was that from uh, a commercial point of view, it's not just a question of putting the genes in, but optimizing their expression. And they put them in one at a time and make you know, hundreds of transformers and find you know, stable expression. Because in the early days, there were things put out in the field which would suddenly turn off in mid-field trial. And there were some quite notable disasters in the early days. So now they're very careful to make really large numbers of transformers. Now, if you've got position effects and you are trying to stack traits, you've got to do each one individually. So that, that's partly the constraint. They're trying to get around that issue rather than the practical aspect of just putting the numbers of genes in. So. Um, there, there's other technology that's coming out for gene targeting. Two different companies have it. Um, with, uh, there, there's efforts by people like me to make these companies more amenable for, uh, for the academics. But you can do gene targeting now. So that would largely... Pardon? Let me just be a little quiet on that because okay. it's a company that I'm working with and I, to be fair, I'm on their board so I want to just leave it there. Can you guess and you'll... <laughs> www.precisionbioscience.com <laughs> All right. Oh, you didn't hear that from me. All right. Uh, targeting. I have a question about, um, I wrote a short white paper once in, a few years ago about uh, working in a bioenergy crop and got hammered about um, fear of horizontal transfer and letting loose these genes. Is there some thought on BioBricks somehow to get around that to put some sort of a uh, uh, kill signal? Well, yeah, there's, there's the Terminator technology that was uh, developed by the USDA, um, and there's a lot of GERTs, uh, uh, genetic uh, restriction yes. technologies that are available. The National Academies of Sciences did a report on it. It would be really kind of a neat idea, I think this is a wonderful idea, to have those available through a, a, a company like BioBirds, or a, a, set, or a set like BioBirds. Genetic use restriction technologies, micronet. Because that, that's the big problem of turning uh, just, you know, plants to the 15-year-old the in the garage is no, no one wants an ecological disaster. I think that we need to be very conscious of that as a community. Yeah. Do you think that that ecological disaster 
is more likely with plants, or it's just that there's already been a, a public perception issue um, with plants that maybe hasn't developed yet with, you know, or just isn't as strong yet with re-engineering microbes, um, et cetera. If you remember what happened, um, I'm going to date myself here, but with, uh, there was some grapes that were being imported into the U.S. from South America, and one of them was found to be contaminated with a rather nasty, one grape was found to be contaminated with a rather nasty pesticide. And the consumers in the U.S. stopped buying the grapes throughout the U.S. because one grape was found to be contaminated. Um, and so the kind of um, I, the, the, the world, I'd rather be much more cautious and much more careful. A, a phrase I, I learned, which I would share here, which is perception is reality. I actually have a comment on that, too. I know that Monsanto was under a lot of criticism because they had um, seeds or something that, that flew to someone else's fields, and then they got uh, distribution, uncontrolled distribution of their plants. So I heard this on the news. And um, I was wondering from the talk the other day and also from your discussion of tissue-specific promoters, do you think in the future it would be possible to limit that by preventing expression of uh, trans... Uh, trans genes, as it were, in seed seed uh, plant tissues that generate seeds? There's, there's, uh, there's a lot of research on that. Um, none of the GERTS technologies that are out there right now seem to work perfectly, and so you can never say you can prevent anything like that happening again. Um, and you always have the problem, even if you can prevent pollen flow, and if particularly in the example of the canola you used, you can't prevent the seed flow necessarily. So, um, but in some cases, you don't want to do that because farmers like to keep their seeds. Yeah. That was what got Monsanto in trouble. Farmers like to keep their seeds and use them year after year. Yeah, although they're under license not to do that in most cases. <laughs> yeah, that raises another issue, which is you know, moving away from some of the uh, commercial strategies that people are using to a much more open source based model and particularly as <coughs> as we move forward then the speed of engineering and the quality <coughs> and the types of changes that you can make are going to become much more substantial <coughs> the question is if it's like the software industry where we're reprogramming existing crop plants and the speed of that means that small companies that might actually crack the monopolies that some of the large companies have, or at least erode them. And if there's, you know, imaginative engineering similar to what you see in the software industry, where small groups of people can make changes in a way that's uh, sort of more democratizing, if you like, yeah. there might be a change in the way, you know, because at the moment we have these rather monolithic companies where everything's under lock and key in terms of IP and resources. And it's, I think there's an interesting model to explore there which the synthetic biology community could contribute to. Whether or not it works is another matter, but I think it's a possibility. Right, it's interesting to see if it works. Uh, we're talking about far downstream applications here, but the, the barrier to entry for a lot of companies is, is not just IP, uh, getting licenses from other companies, but it's meeting the regulatory uh, hurdles from, from governments. And, uh, you know, it costs Ten or fifteen million dollars to do all the trials you need to do to get a new crop approved in in even one country. Um, that's that's a big hurdle for a, a, a small company. So yeah, um, I don't know how involved synthetic biology wants to get into that, but again, that's that's more of the legal and regulatory. Of course, if maybe one angle is if things were standardized, if you had standardized parts, then um, they could receive broad approval from a, from a regulator, and, and, and that threshold might decrease. Yeah, there's also the issue of using natural sequences, that is, using endogenous plant elements to manipulate existing pathways. So you, you're not trying to introduce novel biochemical activities, but rather modify existing species. And also if the targets, um, you know, for example, in floriculture, which we just talked about, where there's less risk inherent in the... Yeah. There's actually less opposition to everything except for food here. 
as far as genetic modification. In my experience, people aren't that concerned if we modify plants for fiber or for biosensors or anything else. So it's a big, big um, hang up. Okay. So back to biobricks. Are more reporters, more selectable markers needed? Do we have sufficient reporters to do uh, everything anyone wants to do in synthetic biology? Uh, well, I think the uh, obviously there's more colors to come, but also uh, fusions, so putting things in different places. And I think uh, Fernan could say more about that. Yeah, we, we are using a uh, ratiometric uh, measurement, uh, like Jason and Kim is using in, in, in GIST, um, based on, on, on GFP variants and well, we are using y, YFP, uh, Red FP, and and we are more focused in the in the ratiometric issues and and the ratio of, of these two because we know well in, in plants we have an extra level of, of uh, complexity that is the multicellularity and in different cells these uh, constitutive reporters could could behave differently. So that's why we we want to develop this okay. working ratio. Okay, so we have lots of GFP variants and combinations of those variants you can detect in different ratios and you're looking at those on a uh, tissue specific or cell specific basis. Yes. Great. Okay, so no shortage of uh, available r outputs from a synthetic circuit. This is off topic, but are there any plants, are there any algae that are really like Monocots and dicots. Are there any algae that are really like higher plants? Yeah, I mean, like I, I was looking at clammy demonis at one point, but they're really they're not really even plants. They're like part animal, part plant. So brings up the issue of chassis. Uh, what organisms would you want to use to characterize these things? We've mentioned things like tobacco, which can be easily transformed, uh, at least um, Arabidopsis, of course, well-characterized genetic model. Uh, Brachypodium is coming on as a model monocot. Here's a model for some aspects of development, multicellular development. What is, what is brachypodium? Brachypodium is uh, grass. It's a wild grass, but it has lots of advantages as a model for temperate grass species. Do you want to 
Well, there's a BY2 tobacco cell line. Uh, it has interesting properties. Uh, you can grow plant cells, higher plant cells in suspension cultures. You can. Um, I don't know if there's any uniform cell line that's used in that way. Yeah. Is, is there anything in the plant space like a pluripotent stem cell, like a perpetual cell line that can become again a plant? Yeah, in fact, there's so many plants are so good at being pluripotent that I don't think there's any one particular cell line that's ma maintained, but uh, you just change the hormones that the plant is growing on and it will de-differentiate or re-differentiate into a, a pluripotent mass called a, a callus. And, and you can just grow those. Sure. I just want to throw out one comment because, you know, some of the things that I'm hearing here are basically what I would call an introduction to plant biology and, and introduction, and that, that's really fun and exciting here, folks that are interested. And, and if you are, there's actually a really wonderful course for this that Cold Spring Har Harbor offers every year, and you can apply. They offer free scholarships. It's really a very, very wonderful course, I think it's about four or five weeks long. It's real, but it's real intensive, and, and a lot of really good folks have gone out of it. And it can really, for those who are coming from more of an engineering perspective, and learn, I, I really strongly suggest you might want to consider applying. It's a great class. Um, it's made for graduate level and above. Um, and again, it's really intensive. A lot of very good people come and teach it every year. It's, uh, so just go to Cold Spring Harbor, um, lab, lab, to lab, to lab, to lab. Do you happen to remember what um, time frame in the year it's taught? It's always in the summer, so why don't you go swimming and sailing and get good speakers at Cold Spring Harbor? How many, out of interest, how many non, how many people are in the room who don't work in a plant molecular biology lab? So, pretty much almost everyone. Not yet. Welcome. That's right. That's right. Okay. So, these cell lines, I have to ask one more question. Uh, these cell lines, do they have secondary cell walls? So could you use that as a model system for biofuel, sort of? They have secondary cell walls. I don't know how. For most questions about biofuels, I don't think you'd necessarily want to, to use them. You wanted to develop some tweak it and look at deconstruction techniques. Could you use that cell yeah. line as opposed to waiting eight, nine months each time you can do a tweak Yeah, uh, although you'd have to regenerate the cell line from your but transformed cell each time. Cell yeah. problem I see for synthetic biology with transient assays, they usually give you plus minus information. Does your construct work or not? It doesn't give you quantity of information that synthetic biology typically asks for. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, one thing I thought I'd mention that's relevant. You see people using, uh, even people who wouldn't consider themselves plant biologists at this meeting, using genes from plants, right, using genes, uh, a lot of diversity within the kingdom, using those enzymes for various things. And I think we'll see with the greatly expanded use of next generation sequencing, you'll see uh, uh, increased availability of sequence information from plants, including sequence information for various enzymes and so on. And I'm aware of initiatives that are going to sequence uh, genes from thousands of plants within the next few years, and that, that information should all be publicly available. Can I mention one more thing, which is to do with um, the uh, computational aspects, and, and obviously you're working with a multicellular system, so it brings up issues which are both different from microbes generally, but also from animal systems, because uh, plant development with um, the extracellular matrix, so every cell there is, as it expands and divides, it essentially subdivides itself. So you have this continual extracellular matrix around all the entire tissue that you're working with. And so any kind of issues of morphogenesis, of you know, creation of either growing points or the organs that they make, has to deal with this linkage between the biophysical aspect of growth and the genetic aspect of growth. And in fact, morphogenesis is, part, is the interplay between those two processes. So if you're doing anything which is changing shape or form, it means you have to have some kind of computational model which incorporates those two things. 
So the idea that genes encode morphogenesis is completely bunkum in, uh, in plants. It's actually the interplay between that and the physical aspect of growth. And so that's, you, you need, models are, are quite important there that integrate the biophysical aspect of growth. And, uh, and there are a number of groups now who are starting to play with uh, finer element models to incorporate that and cellular automata, uh, which bring those two things together. I think that's actually quite important because, and it's a way of getting emergent behavior out of the system, which is it's very interesting to work with. Right. Uh, okay, so I think we've covered existing resources and tools, tools that are under development. Anyone want to add anything to what's still needed or what's under development? What? Go ahead. Selectable mark and the the report gene because in the next in the food pro product uh, the fact uh, the produce normally uh, deleted the select gene and the the report gene and we don't know where it come from and where uh, where it right. uh, or what it is it so it maybe there's some category of the trispo I don't know if the 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 good, uh, a good term for for this kind of category. Okay, so uh, I, I just 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 wondering. Okay, yeah, yeah. Good, good question for discussion. Should phytobricks include uh, traceable sequences, DNA barcodes or something? Yeah. We could go the opposite way, which is to make them as untraceable as possible, making them as natural as possible. Natural. <laughs> okay. Given the concerns about uh, modified plants. Yeah. Although you're going to. Yeah. For many of the sequences, you're going to quote on optimize them anyway, right? In database for plants. Because uh, less of less uh, data is available on microRNA. That's true. So, uh, if you can develop a database specifically mm, for many species, like tomato and all, very good for uh, developmental biology work. It's true. I've ignored all of the different types of RNA constructs you might have. There's a big computational effort in the U.S. called iPlant, um, as some folks are aware of it. NSF gave, um, well, Rich Jorgen, well, pardon? Oh, 50. No, it, was 50. it was 50. 50 million dollars to develop computational resources for a plant biologist. And uh, they've had their first round and they're largely going in and um, basically doing what I would call computational tools for database mining. But one of the things I've, I've been trying to talk to them about is, um, you know, how could those of us who are interested in plant synthetic biology plug into iPlant? And uh, I know that there's good interest on iPlant that's saying, you know, we are interested too. So the, these, it's supposed to be um, computational tools for plant biologists. And so maybe some of you folks could have suggestions. Yeah. So the iPlant consortium is unusual in a number of ways. One, $50 million, none of it can be spent on data generation or wet lab experiments. It's all supposed to be developing so-called cyber infrastructure. But to access that, the $50 million went to a group of scientists who are supposed to divide it up now among other scientists who come up with good ideas that show there's a need for um, a particular type of um, interface or software to be used in plants. So they divided up. Some of it given it to a group who's studying the tree of life, so they're doing phylogenetics, but there's still a lot of money up for grabs, and if you can come up with a good proposal, you should talk to June and uh, see.
you, you can put something together. It, I think the applications are sort of a one or two page it's, so it's a very short application of one or two things, and um, if, if we're interested, if those of us interested in plant synthetic biology are interested, we need to do so really fast because I think the next round is December. Um, so, um, so you basically, the, the typical way you do this is you propose to have a workshop, um, and it's not bad, a workshop in Arizona in the middle of the winter, I mean, you know, this is really not too bad. Um, and, you know, you get folks together, and it's supposed to be like a community-driven thing. What is it the community wants and needs? Um, and so I think it's something that would easily tie in with synthetic biology. This is like somebody proposes the idea of the right screen for... Well, it sounds like Jim's already got Phytobricks going. And, and, you know, I guess the thing is, yeah. is what, you know, what do we need independent of what Jim is doing? Yeah. And, um, I think anything that would be with that would need to have Jim there, too. Yeah. So, I mean, what, you know, we're, we're kind of old and crusty. What are your ideas? So, one thing we haven't talked about is um, agronomy. Mm -hmm. Actually, growing things. So, if you want to actually make the link between uh, the field, then data like that is quite important. Mm -hmm. How you integrate that is quite important. How do you integrate? Well, how do you generate it, right? It's okay. Prohib. You mean like the measurement of the stochastic parameters? Uh, well, also the genes which might say promote drought tolerance. Which you know, if there are these things already. Well, Monsanto will get them out. <laughs> no, but whether you can make an open source version. So. Oh, Jim, you are going to get sued. <laughs> so, uh, brainstorming. You're talking about making it easier easier to do these types of field tests, which are, are necessary to do. Right now, you really do have to go through a, a big company who can afford to do the tests for the most part. You're talking about the community coming up with a way to make this well, I think there are, easier. As the field matures, there's, there are sets of genes which are, or these families of genes which are known to produce improvements under certain circumstances. And so the issue of testing becomes less of an issue once they can become better characterized. And there are markets where people can't afford to pay for these things. And there are already projects, uh, for example, if John Innes uh, has projects in collaboration with people in Kenya uh, and other parts of Africa to take African crops and improve them. Often it's pest resistance. Uh, but you know, if you've got something on like BT toxin, for example, which is now pretty well characterize what what really does need to do is obtaining the, the appropriate uh, line, transgenic line, and doing field tests, but the actual mechanism itself, the basic, if it's a fiber-brick or fiber-brick component, that's probably less of an issue. It's more to do with its context and the, the actual transgenic domain. But presumably that, you can imagine that that will, as the field matures, become more and more the case that you'll have sets of genes which do stuff, and then you'd be able to take those and put them in different contexts and different crops. But you need to somehow capture the properties, the raw properties of the DNA elements, and then correlate that with the field performance. Okay, so you're talking about standardizing some of the existing uh, uh, successful well, or... capturing the information that's already there. Capturing the field data? Well, uh, your performance, whatever it be in the lab or the field, if something has been used, I mean, there's this, uh, I guess we talked about this this morning in Biobricks, in the context of, uh, say, for example, performance of parts and microbes, so looking at promoter activity or some other indicator that you want to capture that in some fashion. And this is probably even more of a case when you're talking in, in the plant field because you have all these agronomic characters that you also really want to capture in some fashion. Okay. So the database then of the parts registry, whether it's uh, wherever it is, can require that kind of information, right? That kind of descriptive performance information. Okay. Okay. Um, I wanted to sort of along with that, is there a way to expand awareness of synthetic biology within 
plant biotechnology community? In other words, is there a w uh, many people who are involved in plant biotechnology would be interested in uh, this type of standardization sharing, uh, depositing something in a, uh, a registry, making things compatible. Is there a way that we can encourage this within the plant community? What is the general attitude towards synthetic biology in the plant biology field? Like, I mean, if you look at like stem cell field, what those folks view of our field is it's kind of frosty. But what what do plant cell biologists think of us? Why why is it frosty? Oh. First. Because we make toys, okay. and we make things, and they don't like making things. Um, roughly two months ago, I believe Pam Silver told people there are no people, there is no one doing plant synthetic biology. Um, I, I was pretty shocked myself when I was in the UK last fall and found out Jim was doing plant <laughs> synthetic biology. Um, I think that makes, um, and, and there's someone from China who I have not met from doing rice. I don't know if she's here. I, she, he, I, 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 so I, 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 um, I think. It, 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 with the with the person from China that makes three of us. Um, there's six different networks in synthetic biology. Um, uh, we're part of one, uh, sort of the iGEM style thing. But there's a whole network on uh, natural products and manipulation of natural products in plants, and so it's run by um, Rob Edwards up in Durham. And there's there's a number of people involved in that. So I think you know it depends how you define synthetic biology. I mean, a lot of people are curious about the tools, but as Chris said, that there's a certain degree of skepticism, and I think that in the plant field is probably even more profound because there's quite a long history of uh, proper geneticists, people who are doing proper plant plant improvement, mm -hmm. looking down their noses at plant molecular biologists, and so that now, I mean, if you think of synthetic biology formalizing molecular biology in some fashion, that's even worse. So, uh, and, and clearly the, most of the, the species, the crop species out there have been improved and produced by proper plant breeders. Uh, and it's only you know, really relatively few that are, that are transgenic and produced by molecular biologists, even then they use breeding techniques to, to make them. So I think you know, we're really on the outer. So we're talking about 10, 20 years down the line, um, but, you know, I don't think you can really, I mean, if you think they're useful for microbial systems in plants, arguably they're even more attractive because I think with a multicellular organism and you have already a set of differentiated cell types that you can potentially play with, and so you have this extra level of abstraction feasible. Mm. So if you play around with mechanisms which involve extracellular decisions, so the, the, the negotiation that takes place during development, and you can apportion cells in different to different types and places in the organism, essentially similar to what happens in natural breeding or, or not naturally with human selection. We look at corn versus teosinte, where you've got essentially the same biochemical properties, but very different numbers and proportions of cells, and and that's what produces the high yields. Mm. And then you don't worry about what's going on inside the cells. You simply have uh, transcription regulators which tell things to be what in different times and places. Yeah. So I think, you know, in terms of the limited number of, you know, it's another level of abstraction further up the hierarchy, I think that's quite attractive. Yeah. But we'll see. To, to, be, to be fair though, um, you know, there may be something to what Pam Silver said. Uh, I've heard Drew Andy say that Jay Kiesling isn't doing synthetic biology. That he, he likes Jay respects them, does great work, but it's not synthetic biology because it's not standardized. And so it depends somewhat on definition, and then when you're getting into definition, you start pissing people off one way or another. And so there's thousands of people doing plant biotechnology. Many of them are doing the kind of really cool rational design stuff um, uh, that we've heard some of and we'll hear more about tomorrow. Um, but hardcore synthetic biologists would say it's not synthetic biology, it's not standardized. If the parts aren't standardized, I can't reuse them and so on. And then on the other side, if you go around talking about synthetic biology to some people who have been doing biotechnology for 20 years, they say, you jackasses think, and I'm quoting actually, think <laughs> you invented the wheel. We've been doing this for, uh, you know, this is my career. I've been doing this all along.
So, yeah, but I, I, I don't think there's really hostility, uh, generally. So how can you expand awareness? How can you encourage more plant scientists to standardize their parts or to contribute their parts to a registry, things like that? I guess it hasn't really worked in any other field yet. There's no, uh, no journals really require microbiologists or animal scientists to deposit constructs, standardized contracts, put them in a journal. But, you know, one way to make it work is to have really high profile journals require this kind of deposition, but I can't imagine at this point that, that happening. Even I didn't think it does something really cool with plants. Yeah. Yeah, that's part of it. We have is to actually do something with plants in a very short period of time. Well, I know Jason Kelly showed me some moths that's actually constant. You might be able to. That's, that's not plants, but that's a start. It's plant. And not many people that, sorry, there aren't many people that have done anything like that for iGEM so far. But even Chris Matrella is Let's say you get, let's say you get two chances. <laughs> Two or three chances in your uh, ten-week competition duration. Yeah, and depending on the application, what June said about transient transformation <laughs> is correct, but there might be things that you could express transiently in in, in plant cells, and that's. And to be fair, having it looks like little trees growing on plates from the photos, and that's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just don't really have visible physiology when you look at them on a plate, sure. so. <laughs> All right. But there's no reason why not. Yeah. You just take some lessons out of the plant handbook and start building in Multiple differentiation species. mechanisms. <laughs> and there's there's another angle on the plant yeah. of like a, I don't know, it's someone at UC Davis who did this, but you know, engineering viruses that say encode uh, you know, a therapeutic protein or something and using them as, as lytic agents. That, you know, they're lytic viruses that you're putting on harvested plant material. I mean, that, that's a different sort of application of, of plants, but that's something that happens on a fast time scale for engineering. Yeah, that's another type of transient. Like the virus induced genic expression systems that you're talking about? No. I don't think that's what he's. Epitope uh, um, well, it's like this, but there's various viral vectors out there that can do transient assays. However, um, it, the, the practice in itself is really good. You take the virus and you rub it on the leaf and you see a gene product. Mm -hmm. It sounds really good until you realize that it's not quite that easy and you have to control things like humidity and other such things mm -hmm. to actually get it to really work. They're talking about big vats of, of plant debris and they throw... Yeah, it's not big, it's transient infiltration. Transient infiltration? Yeah. Well, infiltration of viruses into plant tissue. Yeah. Transient expression through infiltration. Right? I mean, I, I've never been involved in IGEM, but is there any particular reason why you couldn't have two teams going concurrently that worked for a year and then went to the next jamboree? You know, just had a, had a longer time scale and you'd have kind of, you know, sophomores and juniors start and then they would go, you know, every, you would go a two-year cycle. They could go both each, each year and set their progress. Sure. But like traditionally, I guess it's probably something coming up. Maybe. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I think a lot about running IGEB and just the uh, educational experience of it and, you know, part of the big thing with iGEM is that they go through the whole process of inception to completion. So I think it, it would be really hard to do that in plants. I mean, when you have a continuance year after year, then they lose the design phase for the early. It, the it's not a past year. Yeah. Well, Mike's done some. We, we, might, we did some iGEMs this summer, last summer. Oh, yeah, we, yeah we've done. done. So what, can you describe what you did with iGEM? We didn't do. We, we, uh, everything was bacterial, except for the plant vectors we made this year. So, yeah, I mean, in theory, if you had some, 
students and people who's really keen to do it, you, you could come up with a project where you'd, you could have some intermediate point where you had a transient expression for the first year, and then you had stable transformation the, the next year, and, and, and maybe that second year then would have a, um, a transient transformation for the, the following year or something. It's, so it, it's, it's possible. Maybe there could be a plant I gem. I wasn't necessarily suggesting that a project got passed from one team to the next, but rather that the life cycle of the team would be two years. Mm. But you just have two running concurrently. And you can still go from inception to completion just over a longer time period. It'd be tricky, but not impossible. So the other possibility is to have it uh, as, a, as a dry graph, so it's a biomatic graph, the models of getting to the stage now where you can virtually grow plants. So then you have a challenge of creating some kind of hypothetical uh, patterning system that promotes cell growth and differentiation in such a way that you can, uh, you're using illusory techniques, of course, to generate circuits that way. So I think that, that actually is a lot of fun, potentially, if we get towards that point. Sorry, I got to say, I would like to see wet lab plants in there. But yeah, you could use fire bricks or fighter bricks if you had them. If you had them. If but you had but them. even within the iGEM, even with the current iGEM framework, it's a race to get a, a circuit in place and get it into bacteria by by September. It's you know but maybe. If you were actually doing a plant team, I would consider the bar. Like if yeah. you could pull off one cool PSI out of fighter bricks or something in a summer, you would win the iGEM competition. Like, it would not take much, right? Like, you'd have to just pull off one thing, like, and you'd be the first plant to yeah. do something cool. Yeah. It's, it's not fun. There are ways you wouldn't necessarily have to generate stably transformed Rhabdoctus. You could regenerate a tobacco shoot, right, and look at a leaf for the sake of well, you items. You swipe systems from factory and refactor yeah. them. So, I mean, having banana smelling their rabbit off would be yeah. quite nice. Yeah. That would be <laughs> so that gets into, actually, one thing we should mention then. It, it, uh, um, of course, plants being eukaryotes have different regulatory systems, different codon usage, and so on. That applies to the nucleus. doesn't necessarily apply to the plastids. So it's possible that if we had biobricks also for expression uh, of genes within the chloroplast or mitochondria, we could use more of the microbial biobricks. Chloroplast. I think they should all be called biobricks. You're saying DNAs that go into the chloroplast or proteins that get targeted? The chloroplast has its own genome. And you can modify and, it. And there are some examples of genes being introduced into the chloroplast genome also comes with its own complications and, and limitations, but, yeah. I mean, it has, in a sense, kind of technically difficult, 
Uh, more technically difficult than transforming it into the nucleus, but it's not widely done, and so maybe as, as it becomes more widely done, it becomes more more simple. Um, yeah. transform one at a time, so then you have to get it um, homo. So how plastic. about uh, engineered E. coli as an artificial plastic? Sounds like a good iGEM project. Okay, any other comments? Any last comments? So uh, let me get, anyone else want to be on this list? I'm going to try and get, I think a list circulated for email addresses. Is that out there? That's up there. So I'll write up a summary of this and email it to you if your name's on there, and that will form some kind of contact list. Uh, you're encouraged to think about these grand challenge ideas, what cyber infrastructure is needed for plants. To put together a proposal, it'd have to be led by June as a scientist working in the US. But uh, iPlant is very flexible about involving international scientists as well. Um, and then great ideas actually for the um, plant iGEM or for iGEM and increasing the inclusion of plants in that kind of competition. Was there a hand? That's it. Yeah. Another comment? All right. Okay. Any last words? All right. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy your night. <laughs>